Is Only Angels Have Wings one of your favorite pictures? I liked it very much. Well, it came from a true story. There was such a little airfield. They had a man up who radioed, told them when they get through the pass. A little chorus girl stopped there, coming from a tab show, ran into this fellow, got a little tight, slept with him, fell in love with him, and hung around instead of going off. And he married her, and they were two of the happiest people I've ever seen. Mm. That's what Dean Arthur played, the same stuff. Mm -hmm. People you knew. I met them when I was flying down there. Mm -hmm. I made a few changes, you know, about who came in there. They didn't tell me those things like Dick Barthamus, but, but that was true, too, because I saw a fellow who jumped out and left somebody in an airplane, and he never got along with anybody, any flyer after that. Mm. I saw the guy, I saw the airplane come down and kill the guy that, when he jumped out. In the, in the war, you were in the Army Air Corps. Mm, well, it wasn't the Army Air Corps, it was the Signal Corps. The Signal Corps was the Air Corps. And uh, then it afterwards became the Air Corps. And, and I understand you, you were, became a second lieutenant, is that right? Mm-hmm. So you went, on, you went on bombing missions or, or...? No, never got overseas. They didn't have the aeroplanes at all. They didn't even have the aeroplanes to train people. We were in Texas, uh, supposedly, to fly. and Oh, there were two or three thousand cadets down there waiting to fly, and they had about seven or eight aeroplanes. So we applied for almost everything we could to get out of there, and I applied for uh, spotting for bombing. And we went to Fort Monroe, Virginia, and worked out of uh, the airfield near there, and they, they had some rather heavy, powerful airplanes, de Havilland's. And we were there when the armistice was declared. Mm. How long were you in the, in the um, Signal Corps then? For a couple of years? About a year and a half. And uh, I, you told me once that you used to build, around this time, or was it later, that you used to build um, racing cars and, and planes and things, or, or was that later, or when was that? Well, that was after the war. I raced for about three years, and we had to do our own work on our own stuff, and we got help from our friends, and you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Victor Fleming and I were built a couple of aeroplanes. One of them was very fast. It broke its landing gear every time it landed. We used to call it the cast iron wonder. <laughs> it was very heavy, and uh, but we knew if we could get up and everything, we could go faster than anything that was around. It was just a question of getting it down without breaking it up. <laughs> How did your brother Ken happen to get in the pictures? Just followed you out? Mm-hmm. Well, he was out here living, and I got off to a good start, and he was interested, and so he started, and he had some very good ideas, and finally got to direct the picture, which he was directing when he was killed. Yeah. That must have affected you rather badly when he died. It did. And uh, I've often wondered if uh, the Dawn Patrol uh, was, uh, you know, influenced by his death. It's a pretty bleak picture. Well, at the beginning of the war, he and his roommate, my roommate, myself, and two of our best friends enlisted in the Air Corps. And two of them were killed on the training field of Dissident in France. Two of them ran into each other going up after a balloon down in Italy. And my brother was killed in that accident, so I was the only one left. And uh, I don't know, I always thought of it that it was just you know, the luck of things, that that's the way it never, it never frightened me about flying. Yeah. And it was odd, the <clears throat> day my brother was killed, he asked me to come down to uh, a field where they were taking off, and he told me about what he was going to do, and I said, you better look out. There's a chance of running into one another, and then there's one fellow that's flying out there that I don't think is too good. And he said, why? And I said, well, I was up in an airplane in the storm one time, and he quit. You know, he just got yellow. I said, he really shouldn't be in any tight place, because he's never not going to keep his head. So the assistant director called him, and he said, OK, come on, 
And I said, I'm not going to go. I've seen a parachute jump so many times. I'm going back and do some work at the house. And I went back to the house, and they called me, and they said, there's been an accident. I said, did they run into one of them? And they said, yes. And of course, they, um, it happened uh, offshore, out over the ocean. They were making a scene. Mm -hmm. It was interesting that in 1939, when there were a lot of, there's a lot of flying going on uh, in the world, uh, you chose uh, such an isolated place to have, a, you know, an, air, an airfield. I suppose it was to give you that feeling of isolation and also because it was still dangerous there. Well, it was the one place in the world where that ex condition existed and made for dramatic things and it had all the quality of ceiling zero, you know, the best scenes in ceiling zero, right. just to make these guys fly. And they were a hard-boiled bunch and I met them and uh, they weren't at that airfield at the time, but I met them and they told me about that airfield. So I just combined the thing. Was the whole was that whole picture shot on the st uh, in the studio? Could because it's a remarkable feeling of atmosphere to that picture. Oh, we sent people out to get flying scenes, and the, the big crash of the big airplane. We did it on the back lot. Mm. We built a uh, ramp and turned the motors on and brought it down and crashed mm -hmm. in reality. But the whole port of Barranca was was. Oh, uh, that was a beautiful job uh, under a tent. Under a tent. Over on uh, in North Hollywood. It was really good. Oh, beautiful yeah. stuff. Great lighting, too. Who was the cameraman on that? Joe Walker, yeah. He was C Capra's cameraman. I think Elmer was Dyer was an air aerial, aerial, aerial mm -hmm. stuff, yeah. Um, the other thing you do not you do that in a lot of your pictures is that you never really show the outside world. In other words, they go off to have some drinks, and you only stay within the sort of enclosed world of... Mm -hmm. Is that a sort of a, to give a feeling of, of unity to the story, or just to keep it claustrophobic? Because you did that in, in Dawn Patrol, too. you never really go away from that You've got area. people that are watching. Why get them out in some strange place? I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. Not if you've got a good story. If you've got a bad one, that's the place to go. Just stay where the action, mm -hmm. just stay in town. Stay wherever it is. What the hell did you do in the last picture? Yeah, I know. I didn't ever leave that town. The lighting in all your pictures has the same basic look to it. I'd say, particularly thinking of Girl in a Report, Dawn Patrol, Scarface, I mean, of the early pictures, and then it's the same later on, but thinking about very dark, your movies are generally very dark. What made you decide to do things, look, make it look that way? Just felt it looked better that way, or, or what? Oh, I think it's because it's more dramatic. It doesn't look like a, you know, uh, the comedies that were made at that time in black and white. And uh, also, it's an awful lot more interesting to light it on one side and not light the other side. Well, you get a much more interesting face. And. Uh, and where did you get the idea, or well, you do it in almost all your pictures, your basic source light for a scene is usually a low lamp sitting on a table, or, or uh, and that's usually the source for the whole thing. Am I right? I think that, that if you use artificial light in making a scene, photographing artificial light, you ought to use it. The lighting on, um, on the angels have wings, which was very good. Uh, very, the light that was at the side of the room, a lantern, we painted the circle of white beneath it mm. so that we didn't have to bother with throwing the light down there and everything. Oh. And you never ran into the, you know, the uh, after effects of the thing, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, the, the refracted light and things like that. Well, you've used uh, a score of different cameramen all through your career, so, and the lighting always remains, looks the same. So, obviously, you have quite a bit to do with how it should look. Now, do you tell the cameraman? How do you communicate with them? How do you work with them? If I know the man, if I worked with him before, and if I'm communicating with him, there's no trouble at all. If not, we turn out all the lights on the set, and then I say to the electrician, throw that down here, will you? 
And then after setting that one light, then two or three more, and I said, there's the effect. How you get it, I don't know, but that's the effect I want. Mm -hmm. So they have had no trouble getting it. I see. So you ask him to, you, you, tell, you show him the effect that you'd like on the set, and then he makes it work for the camera. Yes, because this, the effect of the eye is it's not, not the same. Right. There's a very good shot in Only Angels Have Wings when there's a shot of the birds on the ground, but the planes are flying. In other words, you're showing that it's unnatural to fly in that weather. Oh, yeah, and in Ceiling Zero, we called it bird walking weather, because that's what we used to call it. Mm -hmm. What kind of weather? Oh, bird walking. When the, when the birds come down and start walking around, then <laughs> I, I think it's a great description. It is, isn't it? Yeah, you told me you didn't like Jean Arthur in the in the picture, and I think we had recorded that, didn't we? That, that she didn't listen to you. No, Jean didn't want to try anything that she hadn't tried before. She was awful good in her own line, and she was just uh, frightened to try something. And I told her when we were finished, I said, you and a few people that I worked with, I didn't think I helped at all. Someday I'll sh you can go and see what I'm going to do this character that I wanted you to do. And so when she saw the call, she went over to the house and waited outside till I came back. And she said, I saw it. She said, I was an idiot. Any picture you want to do from now on, don't even tell me the story. I'll agree to do it mm. and, and do anything you say. And anything. Mm. She's so good, you know. She, I, yeah, it she was did. just a quirk that kept her from doing it. I like that whole attitude that you have about the, 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 the minute he hears that she's a chorus girl, he is immediately antagonistic of her and he made up his mind that she's no good, which is what all characters, you know, like in To Have and Have Not and in Rio Bravo, they, he's wrong, of course, but he makes up his mind that the girl is, where, where does that come from? Oh, I don't know, but uh, by that time I'd learned a little about making the scenes, and I think the scenes with Arthur and Grant, where, uh, you thought they were going off and sleep together, and you got to the door, and you opened the door, and mm -hmm. just follow your nose, and you get to your boat. And then he found her the next morning. She didn't go. Well, that's, you know, those are, you don't have to do any talking about scenes like that. They, that's where she and I had a big how to do. When they found her the next day, and he said, what are you doing here? She said, well, I'm trying to get some deep. You were supposed to go. Well, I didn't go. Well, why didn't you go? Well, they didn't have any bananas, you know what I mean? So, and I wanted her to get all mixed up with her eating and drink coffee with a knife so that every move that she made would have been a laugh. And she wouldn't do it. She wouldn't do it. She said, I can't do that stuff. Well, what are you going to do? You can't force her. But she realized she was wrong and. Uh, said she'd be glad to do it, and she could have done it. It was just, just fear. Yeah. I don't blame her. You make a lot of the fact, out of the fact that uh, the guy who dies at the beginning, Joe, of Noah Beery, there's a lot of lines about the fact that, you know, Grant says, don't take any more chances. I told you to stick to business. And then after he crashes, that was his job. He just wasn't good enough. That's why he got it. In other words, in a sense, you blame it on, on the guy himself for taking the risk. And do you feel that way? Oh, sure. He took the job and he wasn't good enough. You have to do that because what would you do? Have Grant go around moping because he sent a guy out to be killed? Yeah. No. But then later on in the scene, you twist it around and you indicate that it wasn't anybody's fault. It was just fake because he, she says it was all my fault. And he says, yeah. Well, you know when you're through that it was fate. I mean, that's, I'm a firm believer in that. I mean, nobody causes anything exactly. I mean, it was destined to. To happen. happen, so you have to turn around and say that. Mm -hmm. Because it's very well summed up in the line when she says, it was all my fault. He says, oh, sure, it was all your fault. You know, uh, I sent him up in the plane. The, uh, the wire got in the way. Uh, he made a mistake. He made a mistake. And, and so on, so on, all your fault. Ended up by burning up, and you hit lit the fire on him. It was all your fault. You yeah. know what I mean? It was that kind of a thing. Yeah. And you also, the, the whole who's Joe sequence when they all, I mean the whole scene the whole point of that scene really is something that seems to be very much a part of men who live in a dangerous occupation which is that they they actually don't accept death 
do they? If they sat around moaning about it, they'd be moaning all the time. So they just merely brush it off. Brush it off. Didn't we have a scene where he was playing the piano? Yeah. And she came over and said, B flat. Mm -hmm. You better be good, he said. And he got up and she sat down and started to play. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said something to her and she said, who's Joe? And she, they accepted her because, you know, she'd fallen into thinking this. At least she showed she understood. Understood it, yeah. The, the thing by yeah. that time. I always wonder whether the audience is going to, but I'm always happy when they do. Yeah. Um, that was one of Rita Hayworth's first movies, wasn't it? The first one. Yeah? They wanted me to make a test of her, and I said, hell, I'm not going to make a test of her. I'd probably never use her. But she said, damn beautiful. And we'll just go out and make the picture. Oh, brother, we had... Hard time? Well, it was... Asking a girl to do an awful lot, you know, and she was just beginning. She was good. Damn good. Mm -hmm. She was supposed to cry in a picture. And I saw it wasn't going to work out, and so I moved the scene outside and hung up rain machines, and she stepped out, and the water hit her and came down all over her face, and she looked like she was really crying. Mm -hmm. Just remember that. You make good crying scene in the rain. Just put it in the rain, yeah. There's a wonderful thing you did with sound in the scene when, when uh, Grant tells Mitchell that he says, you're through flying, kid, and, um, which is his job to tell him that. And then uh, Mitchell says, after 22 years, well, I guess that's long enough for anyone. And then you have a sound of a motor starting off stage, off screen. And I thought it was very poignant because, you know, it suddenly becomes clear that the sound of the motor will never be the same to Mitchell again. It will always be a reminder that he can't fly. It's a very touching scene. Yeah, it worked good. Is that something you put in, like, when you're doing the sound, or is that something that you thought of when you were, when you conceived the scene, you know? Or oh, when you conceived the scene. Yeah. Um, didn't you tell me once that the thing when the bird came through the windshield and broke his neck, didn't that really happen? Oh, that really happened. Well, it came through the windshield and hit the uh, bulkhead behind the co-pilot. Mm -hmm. and put a great big dent in it. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it broke somebody's neck or just... I see, but so you gave, me the, I don't know, you gave me the idea. I don't know, but it was absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Tommy Mitchell was so great doing the eye test with. And didn't I do the scene where he said your neck's broke? Yeah. Yeah, well, I saw that happen. This fellow said he wanted to be alone when he died because he never, he didn't know how he was going to handle it, and so he didn't want anybody, and especially his friends, sticking around, so. The great line when he says, uh, how is the kid, and he says, he broke his neck, took off a few minutes ago. It's a great line. That's a kind of a Hemingway line, too. I mean, it has that kind of ob mm -hmm. oblique quality. Grant is much more vulnerable character than any of the other leading men in your pictures, you know. Much more sensitive. Sensitive, that's it. You know, Bogart rode right over it. Wayne will get, uh, oh, not maudlin, but uh, embarrassed. Corny. Corny, yeah. And you have to watch out for him getting corny, and you have to watch out for Grant being oversensitive, and you have to watch out for Bogart being insensitive. Yeah. So you've got a tightrope to walk on a lot of those things. Yeah. I had it raining to give a little added touch when Grant went out and stood in the rain. Mm -hmm. But, uh, hell, you don't have to do anything to make those scenes. Uh, you repeated it in, in Rio Lobo. <laughs> Same sure, idea. sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it was also the, the uh, bluntness with which Grant uh, said it, you know. Uh, your neck's broken, kid. I mean, there was no... No, I don't want to do it be gentler and everything when I said no 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 just hit him with it hit him with it 